Good morning. This is pretty much about technology. And so they gave me this piece of technology. And I will use it uh, instead of the clicker. And if I point at you, then please change my slides, all right? So uh, some things in life are really annoying. I guess you all know that. And many of these things are connected to these supercomputers that you carry in your back. It's pretty much about charging the battery. This is what you have to do every night, every evening. You have to connect this thing, and sometimes you forget it. You're in deep trouble the next day. Then there is uh, updating the software. There are these constant messages reminding us that new fantastic features have been implemented, bugs have been removed, software became safer, and you have to install it. And both of these things, charging your battery and updating your software, are totally annoying and take away a lot of your productive time every day. There is another annoying thing about cell phones, which many of you or most of you are not aware of. It really annoys those who produce these things. And these cell phones contain, well, billions of transistors. And they all have to work. And these things are really tiny. You're talking about tens of nanometers or 10 nanometers now. And imagine you have to build a billion or several billion transistors, and they all have to work. If one or a few of them fail, you can throw away the microprocessor, which is a very expensive thing. And so companies like Intel, TSMC, Samsung, they have to invest billions of dollars to produce these things. Now, if you look to our brain, uh, the three aspects that I just discussed are slightly different. Rather than charging our battery, we eat and drink, which is a lot of fun, of course. So that's not a problem. Interestingly enough, the power, that's the energy per time that we move into our brain, is about the same as the power that we move into our cell phones. It's a couple of watts, 10 to, about 10 watts, a bit less for the cell phone, a bit more to the, for the brain. But the order of magnitude is the same. Another thing is, on the right corner here, is robustness. And that is really interesting. There is no company like Intel or TSMC or Samsung that builds our brain cells, but they are growing during our development. And very importantly, they are also disappearing all the time. We all lose about like one brain cell per second. That's 100,000 a day or pi times 10 to the 7 per year which is very, very substantial. Of course, when we were half 10 to the 11, so that's not so bad, but if you think of a microprocessor that loses one transistor per minute, uh, per, uh, per second, it would be a disaster. It would stop working straight away. So the brain has a huge amount of what I would call robustness. Then, most importantly, there is this thing which I now painted red which is there are no software updates. There is no software that you have to download to your brain because it improves your capabilities. But you do that yourself by a process called learning, sometimes also development and plasticity, and you do that by interacting with the environment. So if we could make a system, an artificial system, that has these features, energy efficiency, robustness, and most importantly, the ability to learn, that would be huge. So let's think a little bit what the brain can really do, which makes it so amazing. And I selected the rather trivial thing here, uh, which is just playing tennis. And we say, okay, that also a robot can do, but it's not really true. Because if you think what we do here, it's quite impressive. If you're playing tennis, you can play tennis in any tennis court in the world, even if you have never seen that particular court before. So you immediately adapt to the environment based on the learning you performed many, many years before. It took you a while to get that far, but once you are there, you can do all these things. Then there's a ball coming towards you, a tennis ball, with really high speed. And you see it, and you can move your arm, and you can make something which is very important based on the input from your sensors, from your vision sensors, also from your proprio sensors that, that measure the position of your arms and your leg, you can make a prediction, you can make a prediction where and when the ball will hit your racket. Okay, and that is prediction making based 
on very complex data entering your brain. Now you can hit the ball, okay, and can move your muscles in a controlled way, and you want that the ball is not caught by your opponent, so you tend to send it somewhere else. Again, it asks you to make a prediction. So using complex data for prediction making is probably the single most important thing that our brain can do, and we have a hard time doing this for computers. So building a computer like the brain for these kind of things, and I'm not only talking about robotics, complex data can be more abstract. It can be industry data, for example, business data, science data, medical data, many kind of things. Looking to the time sequence and make predictions would be great, okay? And so uh, let's have a little look on what these systems that we use all the time look like microscopically. And uh, although this is not quite the same scale, it still tells you that these things are different. On the right, you see a microprocessor, an Intel processor, and you see it has these kind of, and I say this very positively, engineering approach. It has clearly clearly defined components like memory, routers, connections, compute units that are connected to form a computer architecture that has been engineered and that is mostly based on the idea of John von Neumann and others, we call that the von Neumann architecture. On the left, you see sort of a, a millimeter slice of cortex, of a human cortex. It's a reconstructed one, it's not a real one. And you see it has this, uh, it looks different. It looks kind of regular, rather uniform. It has a layer type structure, but if you would keep plotting these things over a large distance, it would look like, like everywhere the same. And what it has, is these little yellow dots. They are yellow on this reconstruction. And those are neural cells, and there are fibers connecting these neural cells, mostly vertically, but sometimes also horizontally with each other. And this is the system that does this amazing information processing that I mentioned before. So how can we handle this? How can we build a system that works like the brain? Well, one, is, one idea is to take the left thing and put it on the right thing. In other words, to simulate. Okay, and, uh, all right, um, what you see here is hard to see, it's kind of darkish blue, and it's work done by Henry Markram, one of my friends at the Human Brain Project, and these people simulate brain cells on supercomputers. And the simulation, the important thing about simulation is that simulation tells you how things change with time. Simulations are not just static images, but they tell you how things change with time, and this is what Henry does. And if he runs his simulation, these are about 10,000 neurons, 10 to the 4, they're about 10 to the 11 in our brain, so this is a small system. You see that they fire, so they communicate by electrical pulses, and the colors here represent the voltage between the inside and the outside of the cell. And if you analyze this data, you find, well, it looks a lot like biological systems. But there are problems. One problem is that this simulation takes a lot of energy. And if you look at the second row here, energy per operation. What do I mean by operation? But it doesn't really matter, but it could be like producing one of these spikes, which you have just seen. So if you count the zeros there, there are 14. So the simulation uses 10 to the 14 times more energy than the biological example. 10 to the 14 is 10 by 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 10. That is a lot, okay? And that's not all. There's another problem. And this is a more serious problem is that the simulation, although it looks very flashy, but of course that's just a movie, and it doesn't tell you the real simulation speed. The simulation is a thousand times slower than biology. Is that a problem? Well, I just said that to learn tennis or to learn languages or to learn whatever we do to develop, to build an internal model of our world and our brain, we need typically a year. Uh, so, this sentence is wrong there, I'm sorry. Uh, it should say a day of learning, or say a year of learning, needs about a thousand years of simulation, which is totally out of range. There is no way 
you can run a supercomputer for thousands of years. And at the same time, if you would scale it up to the human brain, the simulation would use about five times all the electrical power that is being produced in Germany, which you would have to focus on one computer and have to run thousands of years. So it's just no way that you can do that. Now let's look a little bit. This is, this is a little bit about mathematics also. Okay, I'm sorry. This is an equation. But this is a technical university, sorry. This is a technical university, so you know what an equation is, okay? Actually, it's horrible. This is a differential equation. And a, a differential equation, the most important thing, on the left side, at the bottom there, you see in the equation, you see a T, a little T, a little T. And the T is time, okay? And then you see a big V, and that's voltage. So this equation tells you how the voltage between the inside and the outside of the cell changes its function of time. And this is what Henry uses for his simulations. So if you go to a supercomputer, what you do is you solve these equations, and you solve tens of thousands of them, and they are connected by these summations which you see there. Now, this is why it takes so long, because th those who know a little bit about mathematics, a tiny little bit, you see that the derivative is proportional to the voltage. Is there a function where the derivative is proportional to the voltage? I guess you probably do that kind of thing at school. It's called the exponential function. So you have to calculate lots of exponential functions. Exponential functions look like that. They are not linear. And it takes a lot of time to calculate them. Uh, and you have to move data across your von Neumann machine all the time. Why? This is why these simulations are so horribly inefficient. Now, at the bottom, there is, in a way, what we really have. We know that our cells are, can be, at least to some extent, replaced by electrical circuits, like batteries, uh, uh, capacitors, and, and conductances or resistors. So what if we do something crazy? If we say we give, out, we give up computing, we don't compute anymore. We build computers that don't compute, that just are physical copies of the brain. The brain moves ions through our cells, and we move electrons through transistors. How about that? Okay? This is a transistor. You probably have seen these things. Transistors have three legs. Okay? And these are the blue things. The legs are source and drain and gate. And this is a computer drawing of a transistor. It's not a real one. It's viewed from the top. And the thing, the blue thing on top is called the gate. And the length of the gate somehow characterizes the, the size of the transistors. This is in real life, typically today, around 10 nanometers or something like that. Now, if you want to build a copy of the brain, you have to be clever and wire up a circuit that works exactly like a brain works. So this is all you have. All you have are transistors. And now you sit on your computer and you wire them up. And now we wire them up, okay? You see many transistors now like tens of transistors. Now you see maybe a hundred transistors, and they look rather irregular. We zoom out, and we see that the structure starts to be more and more regular. And what you see here are circuits for synapses. You now see about, I don't know, a thousand synapses. We move out more and more. Now we see about 50,000 synapses, and we see the border of what's a chip, five millimeter times a, 10, uh, 100 milli 10 millimeter. Then we see many chips, all right? There are also neurons on there. And all these chips sit on something which we call a wafer. That's a disk of silicon. And on this disk of silicon, we have 200,000 neurons, physical models. They don't solve equations, but they are just circuits like the brain and uh, 50 million synapses, which can learn, reconfigure, and do all kinds of cool things. And the great thing is, you remember the circuit? There was a resistor and a capacitor. And this is an electrical engineering school also. You know what happens if you multiply the value of a resistor and a capacitor. You get a time. And that's the speed of the system. It's the decay time of an exponential. That tells you how fast your system runs. So if you are clever, you could build a system where you scale. You scale all the time constant by the same factor, say 10,000. So you could build a system like this one here, which runs 10,000 times faster than biology. Why would you do that? Well, think of the day of learning. 
which in real life takes a day. If you run it on a supercomputer, it takes a thousand days. If you run it on this system, it runs 10 seconds. And that is a system to study learning and development, which is really the key to making artificial neural systems work. That was a computer drawing. What you see here is real life. This is a real piece of silicon. Okay, it's uh, many, many chips. You see them, these little things which you saw on the computer drawing. And this is a disk of 20 centimeters diameter. And it contains, as I said, 50 million synapses and, for, and uh, 200,000 neurons, which you can wire up any way you like. Now, of course, having a disk of silicon is nothing. You have to build a system out of it. And I, I'm tempted to call it a computer, but it's not really a computer. It's a physical model of a brain circuit. This is one of those units which looks very strange. It's about that big. And you see a lot of conventional electronic because you have to send power into the system. You have to send data into the system. You have to read out the data. But underneath this pile of electronics is the matching wafer, which we call a neuromorphic system. Uh, the banana. Finally, there's a real reason for it. Does it all pay off? Should we really do this? If you eat a banana per hour, okay, if you just eat one banana, you get energy. Energy you measure in kilocalories or joule. If you eat one of these things, you get for your body and your brain 500,000 joule. Uh, if you eat one banana per hour, that's about 140 watts, or this is a little bit off there, 0.2 horsepower which is enough to run your body. You can live from a banana per hour. I'm not saying it's very healthy, but energy-wise, energy-wise, that's sufficient. So how does this look like now in terms of computing? The energy needed for, say, synaptic transmission. You know, neurons are connected by synapses, and we s transmit a signal, it, it requires a certain energy. And uh, if you look to our own brain, and I'm not repeating all the zeros now, this is now, of course, behind uh, the zero. We, 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 we need about 10 to the minus 14 joule. You remember, this is 500,000. So this banana can give you 500,000 times 10 to the 14 synaptic transmission, which is really very, very efficient. If you run the simulation on the supercomputer, like the ones you have here in Jülich, for example, not far from here, you typically use up to one joule. So you only get 500,000 synaptic transmissions on a computer if you burn a banana and run a power station from it. Okay. The neuromorphic systems are somehow in between, but on a very favorable way. The neuromorphic systems are typically around 10 to the minus 10 joules. So they are only a factor 10,000 away from biology and a factor 10 to the 10 away from conventional supercomputers. So these are very energy efficient, brain inspired computing systems. More important is, and that's a bit difficult to understand, time for a day. What is time for a day? A day takes a day. Well, it doesn't take a day. If you look to your brain, a day is a day, okay? That's what we call real time. Again, if you go to a supercomputer, a day takes a thousand days because of the slowdown factor. On the neuromorphic systems, the one we call brain scales in our lab at home, it's about 10 seconds. So we have a system that is fault tolerant, it runs even faster than biology, and it's extremely energy efficient. And now we can go and do what people do with neural networks now, uh, like the deep learning experiments, which are still very slow in learning and very energy inefficient. And so what we do now is to move all the knowledge that we have on neural networks and we add our knowledge of learning to make fast, energy efficient learning systems to solve problems that we have to solve for cognitive computing. And the pr problems are typically those which use complex data, find the structure in complex data, and make predictions in time. And as I said, the data can come from many sources. It can come from sensors, vision sensors, movies, things like that, but also more abstract data, like business data, and in particular, science and medical data. And this is what we think is a very important contribution to make cognitive computing a reality. Now, uh, this was very superficial, of course. I just get 
18 minutes and they are over now. Uh, if you want to know more, and I'm sure you want to know more, maybe you even want to try it yourself, uh, I'm not allowed to show URLs here, people told me. No propaganda. So I do the propaganda by telling you there is a website where you can see all the details and it's very easy to remember. It's called neuromorphic.eu. Thank you very much. <laughs>